And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker. A native of Vermont, Patrick Standen is a professor of philosophy at St. Michael's College and a lecturer in medical ethics at the University of Vermont. He is the author of Disability, the Genealogy of a Concept from Prehistory to Mid-20th Century in numerous articles, essays, and poems. He is also president of the nonprofit Northeast Disabled Athletic Association. So, Patrick, thank you again for being here, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Jacob. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I uh, look forward to uh, sharing the fruits of my work in this book uh, with uh, all you good people who've tuned in. Thank you for taking the time to come, and uh, obviously we're, we're competing against some very fine late summer or late spring early summer like weather so i applaud you for uh, making that sacrifice and coming to talk um i should also ask uh, add to what jacob said that i've uh, re uh recently been appointed as a commissioner to vermont's um new uh, truth and reconciliation commission so that's one more um uh feather in my in my cap making a uh, making an already busy life, perhaps even busier. So, but I'm looking forward to the, the great responsibility uh, of that commission, and um, uh, we'll be we will be talking about some of the issues that may arise later on in, in my book. Certainly, when we get to the 20th century. So, um, I'm going to uh, just uh, start uh, talking about my book, the origins of the book, why I wrote it, and then I'm going to walk you through or roll you through uh and for those of you who who uh uh don't know um i, I use a wheelchair and uh you can't really see that on zoom but uh um and, and that's why i have the uh, uh the um barn behind me with the uh, handicapped um, parking sticker on it and uh um, and so I come from a, a perspective uh, that is both personal and professional, uh, lived and um, academic in, in the sense of looking at the concept of disability. And, um, um, my book is an attempt to understand how disability has been conceptualized over time, uh, historically through different cultures um, and different epochs. And it's, it's not an etymology of a word, uh, or the history of uh, a word's usage, uh, but it's the um, it's it's really the history of an idea. And uh, as I'm saying that, I noticed there's a there's a, a, a spelling error behind me on the PowerPoint, and uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I will be uh, scrolling through a PowerPoint. If you if you purchase my book, um, published by the the good the good people over at Onion River Press, um, and, and and here's what the it looks like at this point. Well. I just met, managed to uh, disappear. There we are. Um, and you can pick it up at uh, uh, Phoenix Books locally throughout the state and, and other uh, wonderful booksellers. Um, but um, uh, there are no graphics in my book. And uh, and uh, uh, there used to be in the manuscript, but um, in uh, rushing to get it printed and available for a course I was teaching at St. Michael's College on the philosophy of disability, um, we had to make some choices. And those choices, uh, alas, uh, precluded uh, putting in a lot of the graphs and texts and uh, photos and stuff. But some of them you'll see here. Um, so, um, so with that, I'm thinking about what disability is. Um, you know, I, I'm 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 thinking about this um, notion of uh, um, you know what is a disability and, and and where does it come from? That uh, I'm going to be using for the purposes of our discussion today, the what's known as the medical model of disability, and that's that's a loaded definitional term as a descriptor, and I would normally caution against using it, but I'm using it. Uh, you know, for efficiency more than anything. And what this does, um, this conceptual model of disability, it understands that a disability is a loss of a function uh, or an impairment from what uh, we would call a species-specific behavior. So if you think about the human, um, uh, uh, you know, in any individual capacity, they, they have these capabilities of hearing, seeing, walking, uh, th these sorts of things, right? Um, these are species specific behavior and disability is understood as a loss of one of those. Um, and, and so this is a, a only one of the kind of 
uh, models that we might use to to describe or define disability. And so for the purposes of my talk, I'm just going to be using that one. Um, but it, my talk is informed by the idea that this is a fluid concept. And so we'll see that um, the idea of disability in different cultures that we're going to be addressing tonight um, you know, may have different words, but it's the idea of disability um, that they're addressing fundamentally. And, you know, of course, in this sense, one may be born with a disability, although that brings up, of course, the first issue of the medical model, because if one is born with a disability, one never loses that particular um, species-specific behavior, uh, right? And so that's that's a challenge to that definition. Uh, or, of course, one may develop a disability through some kind of adventitious accident or a circumstance or a condition or, um, you know, those kinds of things. Now, uh, you know, my book, and it began um, uh, many years ago, I think I've worked on it on uh, summer vacations and winter holidays uh, for about seven years. And, uh, and then uh, um, I, I had got it to a completed manuscript form when I sent it out to some publishers uh, right as the pandemic hit and uh, that kind of slowed everything down. And at St. Michael's uh, in the process, I was de de developing a disability studies uh, class that would be the philosophy of disability. And when we, I was given the green light to go ahead and offer that class to our wonderful students at St. Michael's College, I um, wanted this as a textbook. And so I pulled it from the original publishing houses and uh, uh, found uh, a local press that could do it. And uh, and the, the original manuscript went from some 750 pages down to a, a more humble 250 pages designed primarily for students in mind. Um, so, uh, so with those kinds of conceptual uh, understandings and, and, and brief history, um, you know, when we think about disability, uh, you know, disability makes us all materialists, right? In the sense that we, we uh, start looking at bodies and seeing bodies. Now, something interesting occurs in this sense that when we perceive people uh, by one aspect of their being, whether it's a, a, a modality like hearing or sight or uh, a physical condition, uh, um, uh, we, we usually uh, make a snap judgment, a quick judgment, and we, we, we link it to um, already existing information or knowledge that is in our, our brains. Uh, and this is a heuristic, uh, we might call it. And um, uh, often what happens is uh, this snap judgment that links uh, what we see of a person with what we believe we know is is the source of this historical conditioning these social uh, constructions that define disability um, and uh, too often that's where you're going to find the origins of discriminate discriminatory behavior prejudice um, today the world health organization uh, tells us that ableism or uh, discrimination aimed at persons with disabilities is uh, is rampant and one of the uh, single largest problems that uh, that we face uh, and um, they also believe that ageism is another uh, problem right up there and you know with uh, roughly about uh, one billion persons who identify with disabilities uh, that means that we're talking about you know one in six one in eight uh, individuals uh, who have some kind of disability and uh, overwhelmingly that population faces uh, for kinds of discrimination, economic, housing, employment, uh, educational, uh, medical, uh, than virtually any other marginalized group. And one of the uh, interesting aspects of this um, dire situation is that disability cross crosses all uh, of the other uh, groups. So, uh, you know, one can be um, a member of a different uh, ethnicity or race or or and also be disabled right and that brings up this wonderfully fluid and important concept that we talk about in equity studies uh, of intersectionality which uh, means that someone may have uh, multiple identities that can be the source of discrimination but this um, book is going to be looking at disability as um as as that single um force of of disability of, of discrimination um and well 
here's my starting point. Um, I did a TED Talk a number of years ago. And in that TED Talk, I related an experience I had while uh, strolling down uh, Church Street in uh, Burlington, Vermont, where I was accosted by a gentleman um, saying, in effect, that um, the Nazis are right, that uh, people like me should have been exterminated. And I, you know, I, I immediately knew he was referring to the uh, Nazi error program um, called T4, which was a uh, an attempt by the uh, uh, Nazis to uh, eradicate all forms of disability from their culture, you know, in this attempt to create this sort of ideal Aryan um, um, citizen. And, uh, um, you know, it was a very disturbing thing to have happen anytime some, anyone is the object of that kind of uh, virulent hate. Um, it, it causes one a great deal of, of, uh, of, of emotional um, stress. And, and of course, I, I understood the man as having um, a, a crisis, and I, I felt uh, sorry for him, and, um, but that didn't lessen um, the, the, the pain. And it, it got me thinking, okay, why, why is it that we have these kinds of things going on? And around about the same time, there was a certain presidential candidate who shall not be named, who openly mocked a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Um, and, he, and, and really, you know, uh, um, you know, from, you know, from a person on the street to the, uh, you know, what, who will become, uh, you know, the uh, um, resident of the White House, uh, we see uh, this kind of discrimination, right? And, and so that got me thinking, well, you know, since I was writing this book, where does this come from? And so I started looking at the deep history. And one of the really fascinating things that um, my research showed was it's not always been that way. And not only has it not always been that way, the kinds of disability discriminations that we face, these, these kinds of prejudices, seem to have uh, picked up speed with the Enlightenment, right? And so, and, and this is one of the fascinating things. In, in doing the research, I, I, I um, started looking at our, our deep history, our archaeological history. And, and what we find is that um, the skeletal and burial remains of, of, of people from uh, paleo-neolithic cultures actually show evidence of people with disabilities. Not only do they show uh, uh, evidence, and if you look at the kinds of evidences it shows, it shows that, is, that disability is far more common than we'd ever really thought. And, and this, uh, there's a whole new branch of archaeological study called the bioarchaeology of care, which through uh, careful um, skeletal analysis, DNA analysis, and others are looking at the fact that, well, disability seems to be ever present. And not only that, but these people um, seem to be cared for, suggesting right, that disability was not uh, a source of ridicule, a source of discrimination, but that uh, these individuals uh, were, uh, many of them disabled from birth or from accidents or war or, or what have you, and that they were prospering, they were flourishing. And so uh, the photograph behind me shows uh, the um, uh, Manbak site in uh, uh, Northern Vietnam uh, of a young boy who uh, clearly had um, a condition uh, that we understand today as spina bifida, and it would have resulted in um, uh, paralysis of his limbs and uh, maybe some other uh, aspects, uh, but he was going to uh, clearly live until his teenage years, um, and, and so that suggests that there had to be a culture of caring for him uh, present. And uh, uh, looking at the uh, broader archaeological record through our um, we're going to see this again and again. So there's the uh, famous instance of the Nazca boy from um, uh, South America, where, uh, you know, this young boy, again, uh, uh, clearly having some kind of disability that would require additional care and resources. He was clearly uh, well fed, well cared for and valued because he was given a special burial. Um, and, and, and this uh, starts to get us thinking about, well, maybe disability hasn't always been um, the source of fear and anxiety and prejudice that we see it in the, in the, uh, in the modern epic. And, um, and, and again, there's an, another wonderful example in a museum in, in uh, Germany, which 
um, shows the head of an Egyptian princess who had what um, many scholars believe to be some kind of um, cranial deformity. Uh, but despite this deformity, she was going to be memorialized. So she was an object of veneration and, um, dare I say, beauty in uh, for their culture. And and so, you know, with this kind of preponderance of evidence, um, uh, I started to think, well, disability seems to be pretty common. In fact, it seems to be maybe the human condition. And I've been thinking a lot about that. And um finding this evidence that led me to uh, completely um, rethink this historical understanding of disability. And then I started to ask, well, what happened? You know, uh, <clears throat> indeed, and if you look at linguistic evidence, again, many uh, indigenous languages lack the word for disability, right? And so it suggests that they uh, are accommodating. And so um, what we see and what my research and book shows is that um, many of the origins of the discriminatory um, beliefs uh, toward uh, people with disabilities actually come from the Western philosophical and um, um, religious traditions, right? And uh, these, these traditions will become globalized over time, but we can find them coming from uh, ancient Greek and Roman and, and earlier uh, um, Judaic and uh, um cultural traditions. And so if, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, um, you find um, uh, in, in Leviticus, for example, claiming that, um, you know, no person with any kind of deformity uh, or a bent back or maim, maimed uh, or uh, someone who has um, crushed sex glands, I'm not really sure what that means, uh, can approach the Holy of Holies. And if they do, they have to be stoned to death, right? And, um, you know, the very origin story of the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition that, you know, the Abrahamic um, uh, traditions of the book uh, begin with a mark, uh, a, 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 a deforming mark, uh, you know, the mark of Cain, right? You're going to see this disfigurement um, motif throughout history becoming this object of uh, that will become stigmatized, right? And of course, lest we forget, you know, there is that wonderful story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. And of course, uh, he fails to defeat the angel. He doesn't know it's an angel. And, uh, you know, the coup de grace is when the angel uh, reaches and smacks him in his leg, permanently disabling him. And of course, his entire identity changes. And so these are, these become uh, ways of looking at dis disability in the origins of Western culture. And what we start to see emerging here is a binary logic that's gonna pit on the one side, the able-bodied versus the disabled, the, the whole with the um, the broken, the, the beautiful with the uh, ugly. And um, you're gonna see this really develop in the Greek tradition, right? Uh, where ancient Greeks will um, following Plato and Aristotle in particular, start really to sneak in this conceptual uh, binary logic, okay? So Plato and his masterwork about developing a perfect political society um, called the Republic, the book is the Republic, the society is called uh, Callipolis, the beautiful society. Um, uh, said, well, look, we can't have any deformed children here. We can't have any disabled children. You have to either uh, do what the Spartans do and, and, and take that child and expose it to the natural elements and let God decide whether or not that child should live, right? And of course, taking any newborn infant, disabled or not, and putting them outside the city walls overnight in a, any type of uh, weather and in a unprotected meat probably meant that most children were going to um, die in that condition. It was kind of a self-fulfilling uh, act, right? And then, uh, of course, uh, 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 Plato is, is is the person who developed the idea of eugenics, of, of uh, developing and breeding a better human, right? Uh, Aristotle, Plato's student, is going to follow suit uh, with arguing uh, for a hierarchical ideal placing uh, men at the top, the you know, think here of a Olympic athlete, perhaps, uh, or a Greek warrior, 
and um and any deviation from that is going to be uh an impairment a deformation and in his uh misogenetic way of looking uh aristotle felt well the apex is the male even women according to this model are deformed men right so they're disabled so you see this logic starting to build and you're going to find it throughout uh, ancient cultures um, when we get into the Greco-Roman period. Uh, so there's this veneration of this perfect male body, you know, that we see in something like uh, uh, the Doriferous of, uh, of Polycletus. And, you know, you compare that to sort of a sculpture of the same period and you, you, you ver you're going to see a sharp distinction between something that's seen as beautiful, uh, proportioned, mathematically, and um, um, organized versus something that is um, uh, embodied and heavy and um, uh, contrast really sharply. And of course, what's going to happen is you're going to see this as value is going to be placed upon um, the ideal and any deviation from that is going to be pathologized, right? If we understand that, you know, this perfect male form as being the center ideal, then any deviation is literally a dis- ability a dis-ease right um and uh, and this is going to be uh of course addressed with all of these cultural tropes and uh, metaphors that we find in so many places throughout um uh, uh the poems and plays of the ancient world so uh, there's this character in homer's Iliad, uh, and uh, by the name of Thersites, who's a cent not really a major character, but he's the only character, uh, and, and certainly really minor character in all of Homer's uh, great poems that receives really any description of his body, and um, he's uh, um, you know hunchbacked and 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 uh, uh, deformed among all of these. Um, you know, broad-shouldered Greek warriors, and um, but he's also a critic, and he um, complains that the siege of Troy has been going on too long, and that it's too many people have died for what? For the you know the the leader's um, vanity, and it's and 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 uh, and people start listening to him at, at that point in the in the poem when he's um, starting to. Uh, gather uh, the attention of the troops, uh, Odysseus comes in and beats him brutally and uh, and taunts him because of his disability, making references to his humped back and the fact that he's sexually impotent because of his disability. And it's, it's interesting because uh, at that moment when he becomes uh, the object of ridicule, uh, all of his comrades turn against him, and and you know, and and so there's this clear message being sent that one should you know side with the victors, the strong, the able-bodied, not the not the critic and the disabled and deformed Thersites, and and that continues throughout these Greek stories that we uh, that structure our identities and our storytelling to this day. It's another character by the name of Philoctetes who uh, suffers an injury, a, a, a foot wound, um, and uh, his fellow um, Greek soldiers don't want him around, so they conspire to drop him off at an island, and uh, you know, and and they find, unfortunately, that uh, they can't win the battle in Troy if. Uh, they don't have his particular skills as an archer, so they go back and, and, and take him. Um, and what I think this story does is uh, it shows that one's disability is only going to be accepted in society if one has some utility, right? That um, if one is a burden, um, uh, that you're going to find yourself being ostracized and uh, uh, put in one of those liminal spaces where you're going to be marginalized. Uh, one might speculate here about the treatment of future disabled service um, uh, persons uh, from this single literary anecdote and how in after virtually every war, 
um, ancient or modern, uh, we see an increase of persons with uh, disabilities and they're uh, very often um, uh, not going to be treated uh, or recompensated for those, um, those injuries. Um, but the real big story that, uh, that becomes the foundational myth is, uh, is of course the Oedipus trilogy. And let's start with looking at the etymology of the word Oedipus. Uh, you may find it very interesting that the word Oedipus means clubfoot. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the king and queen had a child with a disability and immediately Tiresias, the prophet comes and says, you got to kill the kid, right? He's, I mean, if you don't, if you don't, um, uh, commit a little infanticide, it's going to bring shame upon, you know, the house, at, uh, um, uh, uh, the royal family and the empire. And of course, um, uh, note this because the king and queen cannot kill their child, right? Right? The sort of the inst the parental instinct is too strong, and so the story goes that um, they conspire to have the kid uh, um, secreted off to the mountains where shepherds raise him. And of course, you probably know the rest of the story. Uh, it fulfills Tiresias's prophecy, doesn't it? Because uh, uh, by accident, uh, Oedipus uh, and his father meet uh, on a road, and he kills his father, marries his mother, and then of course the whole. Um, uh, empire will eventually collapse and bear that shame if, and of course the moral of the story is if they had only listened to the, to Tiresias, right? None of this would have happened. Right. And so this is a sharp reminder, uh, to anybody listening or hearing these tales and, um, uh, that, you know, you just, you, you've, you've got to get rid of those persons with disabilities. They, too much of a burden on society, and they bring they bring problems with you. Um, now, there's another interesting uh, uh, character from the Greco-Roman tradition with a disability, and this is the god Hephaestus, and he's the god of the forge and jewelry and um, metallurgy and so many uh, of the arts and the crafts. But he's also disabled, and what does one make of a disabled god, right? You know, um, there's also an ancient Persian uh, story about the blacksmith of Balkh that is very similar, right? Um, you know, and 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 uh, what's interesting about Hephaestus is that he's really the only the only god that is openly ridiculed by other gods um and and people because of his disability and you know, I can always see and notice who Hephaestus is in a painting because he's always going to have a, a cane or something that studies his gait um and of course let's not forget that there is that in this particular myth and story there is that a uh, very important relocating of Hephaestus because Hephaestus is kicked out of Olympia down into the bowels of Hades, right? So, you know, there's this sort of assumption then that if one has a disability, one might um, be allowed to thrive, but only in a certain place, right? You know, the back of the bus or the ramp in the back of the building or the, the one seat that's carved out of the uh, auditorium. You know your place and you have to stay in it, right? Um, and these are the kinds of motifs that are going to start to become institutionalized as we go through history. Well, with the medieval realm, right, and you're going to find similar kinds of stories, uh, tropes and metaphors and ideas within um, Roman culture. And if you look at older uh, ancient cultures like Hindu and Buddhist and Confucian, uh, you're going to find very similar ones. You can find those uh, in my book as well. And uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's this uh, idea uh, that disability is going to be seen as um, divine uh, um, dissatisfaction. The gods make you disabled, um, and and you know you you should uh, avoid that kind of thing. And this is going to become an operative aspect in uh, medieval. And so the medieval period following the Greco-Roman period, so around the year 500, you know, with the fall of Rome being around 476 or so, um, 
is, is, is characterized by the spread of Christianity. And Christianity is going to be treating persons with disabilities in a radically different way, right? And, you know, one of the, the key aspects of, of, of Jesus's uh, outlook and ministry is his treatment of persons with disabilities, right? He doesn't ostracize them or denigrate them. Um, there is, in the principle of the least, a recognition that persons with disabilities um, should have some uh, decent respect. You're going to find this in Islamic cultures too. Um, however, um, uh, that practice is not going to become widely accepted. The older traditions of the Greco-Roman um, uh, worldview will uh, become more powerful and shift people away. So one of the important aspects that arise in uh, uh, as a result of the uh, Christian medieval ages is the development of the institution known as the hospital from uh, Saint Jean uh, de Hospitalier. And um, this was a place where persons uh, with disabilities could find some care. However, um, what's going to happen is it's not going to be a place where persons with permanent disabilities can go. Um, and so if anybody had a disability that could not be improved, you weren't allowed to go, right? And so this space is going to uh, develop in the medieval realm where, um, you know, if you had a uh, uh disfigurement from smallpox and if you survive smallpox it's likely that you would have had a facial disfigurement or scarring or loss of vision or or hearing or you lost an arm or a leg or a hand in a um, agricultural accident or war um, uh, then um, you would find yourself not employable You'd find yourself being ostracized by individuals, but the the very institutions that will develop, like hospitals, will not be offering you any care or refuge either. So persons with disabilities in the medieval realm find themselves cast into what um, scholars call a liminal space. It's this place in between things, right? You're um, you're you're not going to be accepted. Um, uh, and so you have to carve out this transitional space, not belonging to any of the other um, groups within a society. And so what we see in the medieval realm is persons with disabilities occupy the disreputable uh, uh, occupations like theater and comedy and uh, um, uh, begging and so forth uh, to make uh, a, a living and flourish, right? Um, you know, if you look at any um, uh, depiction or tapestry from the medieval realm, you're going to find something that's really telling. So, if you if you take a look at the one on this on your screen right now, and hopefully you'll be you can see it, you'll you'll note that all of the characters, um, three out of the ten, thirty percent, are um, physically disabled. Right? They're they're uh, either missing limbs or holding uh, crutches or or something like this. And uh, and this is uh, the second real epiphany that I had in writing this book. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's evident with this particular picture. Imagine yourself out behind your oxen, plowing your field, getting it ready to plant, right? This is what most people would probably be doing um, certainly around this time of year throughout throughout the world, right? As spring came, you'd be preparing uh, for planting, right? And you happen to misstep and you tear your ACL in your knee. Well, you don't go to an orthopedist and get it repaired. You don't even go to a physical therapist, right? None of those institutions are around. What do you do? Well, you're going to have to learn to live with the pain. You're going to live with it, right? And, and so what you find is the ubiquity of disability in the medieval realm um, had to be so uh, widespread that you really wouldn't even notice people with any kind of disability, right? They were going to be everywhere, right? Um, whether, again, it's through uh, a contagious disease like leprosy or um, something like smallpox or uh, um, an innate 
uh, disability or an accident or war or tripping behind your uh, your ox um, disability would have been everywhere right and the, the the range of physical embodiment that you would have seen on any street in any small village in the medieval world must have been absolutely exciting from uh, a, a, the point of view of diversity right um, but uh, what's going to happen with this? Um, is that these people are going to be still um, not finding uh, their way into positions of power, prestige, um, uh, but rather in those liminal spaces. And a lot of this is, a lot of the re-entry of those Greco-Roman notions are going to re-enter right around the time of the Renaissance and put a halt to any of the... Um, a mirror of practices that we see uh, potentially developing in the medieval realm. And this is best understood if we look at Leonardo da Vinci's illustration known as the Vitruvian Man, because what we see in this depiction is the Greco-Roman ideal uh, that Aristotle theorized about um, being given a visual embodiment right and so here's the perfect male he fits within this this um a uh, careful uh, arithmetic geometry he's perfectly proportioned um and and this becomes the ideal right and anything that deviates from that is going to be less than impaired imperfect and eventually we're going to start um conceiving those uh deviations as um diseased pathologies and so forth right um you know and and it's 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 really and if you think this is old history <laughs> um you know during world war ii when uh when uh, the united states entered uh the war um industrial engineers clothes designers scientists uh medical community members realized realized they had a boon when uh the united states um initiated the draft uh, and they measured all of these inductees and they came up with the industrial standards, clothing size standards that we still use today. Now, what's interesting, it also shows us how this kind of binary logic, this ideal, um, this putting forth of an ideal works in contemporary society. If you think about who, for example, World War II inductees would have been, they would have been uh, largely white, young, able-bodied men, right? And you don't have to uh, be have a PhD in statistics to know that that's a very small sample size. And to base all of your industrial design, uh, architectural design, clothing design standards on that seems to be problematic. And indeed, if you've ever gone through the world and in the built space found that you know, an airplane seat doesn't fit you or, uh, you know, something in the grocery store is too high or uh, there you don't you, you, you land between a small and a medium or a, a six and an eight. Uh, uh, you see why, because these these standards are uh, using a lowest common denominator and assuming a, a kind of one size fits all approach, which comes directly from that Greco-Roman tradition of um, putting forth this ideal over against this, um, these, these, these deviations, right? Um, and, and, you know, you, you, um, the, uh, before modern medicine, you know, we had, uh, those aspects where people would have to hide themselves as lady, um, um, uh, Ashley Montague has got a wonderful, uh, testimony about her experiences having smallpox and how her beauty had been marred. Uh, the, the famous portrait of of, of Duke uh, of Urbino, um, uh, you know, this man with a very sort of distinct uh, profile uh, is done because the other side of his face was heavily scarred by smallpox and evidently had lost part of his face as well. And and this is the kind of thing that we're going to see. And, uh, and it starts to become an issue when we when we go into the uh, period of the Enlightenment, right? I do want to take another little interlude here and, and talk about Shakespeare, because I think Shakespeare 
offers um, a really interesting take on disability. And he, in, in, in a way, as, as the master of language that he is, he's going to present to us um, something that becomes a um, widespread phenomenon that we're going to see embodied later in, in, in film and, and, and television. Um, and, and Shakespeare is indebted to Aristotle in this. And Aristotle wrote a book uh, called The Poetics that uh, described how best to write uh, tragedy and poetry and what art is. Art, he claimed, uh, imitates nature. And that naturalist assumption will be with us until uh, the late 19th century when uh, Oscar Wilde famously quipped that after the Impressionist, nature now imitates art. Um, but uh, Shakespeare uh, will borrow a concept, as all um, uh, playwrights did, uh, from Aristotle. And Aristotle said that uh, if you have a character who has a problem, has some kind of moral deficit or uh, is evil or conflicted, and this is necessary for a good story, right? Um, we tend not to like stories about bland, ordinary, everyday good people. Um, you have to have an inner flaw, and this inner flaw is understood as the Greek word hamartia. Well, what Shakespeare does is shows that he says wherever there's going to be an inner flaw, there has to be a visual outer flaw. And here's my challenge for you tonight. I to think of an evil, bad character in literature or film or theater who does not have a disability, and you'll not find them. Whether you're talking about um, Captain Ahab or Peg Leg Pete or uh, Doctor No or uh, you know any number of characters, um, um, if there's a bad character. Um, that person is going to have a physical uh, disability of some sort, right? Now, what happens is this is a really interesting uh, moment in disability, in the history of disability, because we're going to link um, inner um, turmoil with um, an external manifestation. And nowhere is that more evident than in Shakespeare's treatment of Richard III, who... Um, is described in his own words as you know this this character who is beyond any kind of um, hope and uh, I, I want to read you uh, Shakespeare's words here because they're far better than what I can do um, and uh, and here are the words uh, from Richard uh, himself. Um, you know, he calls himself deformed, unfinished, an ugly hunchback. And here is the, the king, the beleaguered king, describing himself with a, with a degree of self-loathing that is rare in literature. Into this breathing world, Richard says, scarce half made up. And that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak, pipping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time unless to see my shadow in the sun and to cant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, right? And so every stage adaptation, right, of Shakespeare today is always going to have an able-bodied actor um, uh, with some kind of outer flaw characterizing and ridiculing disability, right? Um, now, uh, why I'm making a big deal of this is because uh, we found Richard's body. He's buried under, under a car park in a small town in, in, in England, and it's the subject of a of a recent movie that's just been released. And guess what? Richard III did not have these kinds of humped back deformities. In fact, other, other um, commentators from the time period talk about him as, as being, you know, agile and life, but never mentioning 
any disability at all. Now, we can assume that um, uh, they're uh, kind of like FDR's press corps and hiding the fact that um, the, the president has a disability, but that's somewhat unlikely. But then when you understand the politics of Shakespeare's time, you'll realize that Shakespeare um, wanted to demonize Richard III for um, the royal house that was in charge during his time period. And so he uh, made out of whole cloth uh, this entirely, you know, this, 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 this ideal archetype of, of a demon, which becomes, uh, like with those earlier Greek myths, the way that we tell stories, uh, the characters we depict in films, and so forth. And this, um, this uh, link between um, depravity and disability is still with us today, as, as we'll see right you know the bones don't lie right and and the reality is that they've, they've unearthed what they believe to be and they've actually done dna analysis to show that it is in fact richard the third uh you know and he had some of the old complaints that we all have but none of the uh forms of disability that he's described as having in shakespeare so shakespeare's doing something here with modernity and the rise of science and the mania for classification we start to see this um these these poetic and literary tropes become um, embodied in uh, and given the veneer of respectability in science and medicine. Um, uh, there was a, a fascination with things that um, were considered monsters. It's a whole division of medicine called tetralogy based upon um, an, the ancient word of monster uh, from tetros. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the monster is something God makes that, you know, both um, is a marvel and we awe at, but we also fear. And so cabinets of curiosity during the Enlightenment period included doctors and um, scientists collecting deformed babies or disabled individuals and putting them on display. Uh, there's a famous example of this um, later in modernity when um, – uh, an Irish immigrant went to England and he was known as the Irish giant. He stood something like seven foot two or seven foot five. And uh, a doctor wanted his body. And this young man was horrified that this doctor was uh, hanging around trying to say, well, when you die, I want your body. Right. Uh, so much so that he, uh, this young um, Irishman, uh, writes in his will that he's to be secretly buried at sea and 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 avoided that when he does die and he died young his friends uh were taking his body away and uh uh the doctor and and his henchmen uh found the body and took the body and did exactly what the young man didn't want to have happen uh, the doctor proceeded to uh, boil off all the flesh and uh, today, his skeleton still stands in the British Museum <laughs> dedicated to physicians, right? Um, you know, and, and so, you know, one's body becomes, uh, you know, this, this act of, of, of is, is being stigmatized both in life and also in death. Right. One can't escape it. This is also going to uh, reintroduce the, I, the concept of intersectionality. So in the 19th century, um, P.T. Barnum and others started to uh, collect um, freaks and anomalies and putting them on display for their own uh, their own uh, um, monetary gain. Uh, and one such woman, Sarah um, Bartman, uh, was uh, stolen from Africa and forced into um, uh, slavery, and eventually she's going to wind up in, in Europe being displayed because of her, of her size and her body shape. Um, and uh, after a very short and miserable life of being shown around, forced to stand naked in front of people as people gawked, and, and uh, um, she will uh, die and her body will go on display at a museum in in uh, in uh, in Paris until the South African government, under uh, 
uh, Nelson Mandela was able to successfully petition a repatriation of her body where she was eventually brought back to her homeland in South Africa where she was uh, given uh, a proper burial. No such luck has happened yet to the uh, the, the Irish uh, giant. Um, he's still on display. So people come in and uh, point and gawk um, uh, and, 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 and look at disability and ridicule them in that way. And, you know, the other major uh, aspect of modernity, of course, is um, is the mechanization of the body. When you, when you start to see the body as just this thing, this, this machine, you know, it's going to be further uh, treated in a degrading fashion. And uh, Mary Shelley is, is uh, a major um, critic of this, you know, and the kind of scientism uh, that emerges in uh, the Enlightenment. And of course, her, her Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, is a tale warning us about the unintended consequences of this desire that um, modern science has to figure out and turn everything into a, um, uh, a machine and take it apart, right? And, you know, we're facing this today with designer babies and um, uh, various kinds of genetic analysis being brought on by, you know, CRISPR-9, CRISPR and Cas9 technologies and so forth. Um, and remember that uh, uh, the monster, and just to be clear, Frankenstein is the doctor, uh, and the monster is um, is a, is a person with a disability, right? He's a depiction of uh, uh, things. He's made of of human and animal uh, parts, and he, he he walks with a, a limp, and um, he has a, a variety of of impairments, right? And of course, um, he's like us in every way. Uh, except uh, he can't find companionship and love, right? And again, it's that isolating loneliness um, uh, that is, is is of importance here in many ways. And, uh, um, you know, one other thing I should mention about uh, Frankenstein that's going to bring in how um, modern cinema will depict persons with disabilities is that... Um, there is no hunchbacked Igor in, in uh, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, that's entirely a manufacturer of uh, the first early movies with Bela Lugosi and, and Lon Chaney and others um, when they d are going to be developing this idea that uh, uh, that there was a lab assistant named Igor and that he had, he was hunchbacked and disabled. Right, uh, the buffoon. Right. Um, uh, harking back to the medieval um, harlequin or uh, court jester, which was one of the liminal spaces that persons with disabilities could often find themselves being employed as um, during the um, uh, for entertainment during the Enlightenment. You could order a um, and have a a box of dwarves sent to your house for entertainment. Um, uh, there you go, right? I mean, you know, reduced to uh, others' amusement or ridicule or censure, right? Um, and even when uh, periodically uh, uh, nations and cultures try to in, uh, reduce these kinds of forms of discrimination, you know, and broaden um, uh, rights and, and, and so forth, as uh, originally the French Revolution op tried to do. Um, you see something interesting. I mean, this is a, a, of a uh, interesting point of view from what gets in uh, to our, our studies of history and how too often persons with disabilities or disabled people are written out of history or their disability is whitewashed and forgotten. So one of the major architects of the French Revolution was a um, political figure by the name of Georges Auguste Cuisson, who uh, used a wheelchair and uh, disability and you, and you can here's his wheelchair that he used uh in a museum in in, in france um and you know one usually hears of Robespierre, maybe saint ju and marat uh, when one studies the french revolution but you never hear of couthon and yet he was uh going to be a major player writing some of the central legislation uh and uh he will also um uh his own disability would be the catalyst and eventual uh, downfall. Uh, he was one of the first persons executed when uh, the 
reign of terror and the Committee for Public Safety started to um, exterminate revolutionary figures. And uh, Kuthan, because of his disability, is this really harrowing account of how uh, his body, the the executioners couldn't figure out how to straighten his body on the guillotine. And so they uh, wrenched him in every which way uh, so that uh, they could eventually kill him and causing him a great deal of pain as if, you know, facing one's executioner wasn't enough. And again, I've always thought that that was kind of telling because um, you're not even going to dispatch this guy um uh, in his body, but you have to straighten him like the Vitruvian man first, right? There's something, uh, you know, richly ironic about that. Um, in late modernity, we see another example from literature that I think um, shows how we understand um, disability being framed of uh, these cultures. And this happens in um, the, uh, Flaubert's wonderful novel, Madame Bovary. Um, uh, in uh, this novel, I'm not going to you know, summarize the plot uh, as in similar fashion. I'm just going to cherry pick the story for tonight and invite you to read the novel and my book and frame your own uh, ideas and then certainly reach out to me if you have ideas. And uh, Emma married a, a rather untalented country doctor by the name of Charles Bovary. Um, and she wants him to be more impressive. And there's this uh, character, a pharmacist and, uh, in, by the name of Homé in their town. And um, they concoct a plan. Uh, if he could, if, if Charles could just come up with an innovative new surgical procedure, he'd become the, the new darling of the medical community and they'd be invited to Paris and Emma would be very happy and, um, and that we'd have a lovely ending to our novel. They just need an object to work on. And the object is a little boy by the name of Hippolyte. And Hippolyte uh, was born with a clubfoot. So he's very much like Oedipus. And uh, they, they accost uh, he believe and tell him that he's disabled and he scoffs and he's disabled. I have no disability. I can run and play and fish and do all those things that, um, you know, 19th century French, um, children did, right? When they convince him that his disability is shameful and, uh, doesn't he want to serve the state? Doesn't he want to become a proud and brave soldier? Um, uh, and, and so they convince him that he has to undergo this operation to, fix his foot and be normal, right? Well, uh, he's eventually uh, browbeaten into doing it and the surgery proceeds. And of course, Charles just botches the whole surgery. And not only does he botch the surgery, but uh, the condition worsens, it becomes gangrenous and they have to call in a, a very talented surgeon uh, from a nearby larger town who has to remove Hippolyte's foot. This becomes, I think, a very potent story about disability in uh, modernity's attempt to categorize and medicalize and then uh, sanitize, remove, or cure um, persons of their disabilities. Often what we find is that the cure is even worse than the original disability. Um, and, you know, this is, a, I think, another example of how, you know, the looking at persons with disabilities, we, we tend to demonize and, and treat them in ways. Um, um, and uh, we see this, uh, this this process of medicalization <clears throat> profoundly at play in, um, in early American culture and the rise of slavery, where uh, again and again, and there's a lot of really good scholarship looking at this, that disability and, and blackness and skin color were often going to be paired in a kind of paradoxical way. Uh, uh, the slave was going to be understood as incapable of managing their own affairs. They're going to be understood as uh, deficient or feeble-minded, and yet also physically capable of working. And so this, 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 this idea um, is 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 what structures much of the drive towards um, using humans uh, as slaves during this period, and the medical community plays right in this, offering concocted and quasi um, medical diseases um, 
once they started to assume that race was this biological construct that was real, of course, today we would disagree with that notion, uh, and looking at mental and, dis and physical disability as a biological, right? Um, uh, physicians started to create um, diseases and, uh, you know, that, that uh, would keep people. So, for example, there was uh, dreptomania and dysthesia ethiopius, which were classified by the medical community's disability. In one condition, it, it was just your desire to, to, to leave slavery, right? That was somehow a, a, a disability. So the justification of slavery in America is going to be cast along lines of disability, as well as um, the intersectionality of race, right? And as, as modernity really picks up speed, we're going to see the institution of labor and uh, 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 really um, fuel modernity, right? So the centers of utility and production, mills and factories, these, these uh, places are going to be the source of many uh, persons with disabilities. All up and along New England's great rivers, you can visit mills and, and there are a lot of really wonderful small museums uh, showing you the harrowing effects of exposure to dyes and toxic metals, uh, the maiming of children and, and, and uh, the working conditions that uh, among, you know, uh, dangerous machinery would result in uh, disabilities and disabling conditions. Um, and, you know, so uh, you know, these people would be only of value as able-bodied workers. You know, there were no worker protections and there were no unions to protect them. You know, once a person had a, uh, a particular uh, disability or uh, was maimed or injured, that was it. They were not going to be employed. And as populations swarmed into urban centers seeking employment, a reserved army of the unemployed would make sure that those people were completely without any recourse. If their job went vacant, there was going to be somebody who could immediately step in and do it, right? And so in the United States in the 19th century, while robber barons are reaping millions of dollars and building charitable institutions, uh, endowing museums and universities, there becomes this underclass of individuals in our population uh, occupying very similar liminal spaces as medieval um, citizens with disabilities were, right? And, um, uh, and that's going to be a fascinating study in of itself. Um, you know, the, gate, the great cataclysm of the American Civil War is also going to produce a completely new um, facet of disablement. Uh, one of the uh, things that occurs here is a meeting both of the uh, technologies that are available uh, to uh, hurt and injure people, including the mini ball, which was a particular kind of projectile that was designed to maximize injury. Um, would lead to unprecedented uh, forms of disfigurement and disability that um, that uh, will um, occur on both sides of the uh, combatants in the U.S. Civil War. <clears throat> and of course, like um, Philoctetes, these disabled soldiers will not be given any uh, assistance after um, it, it's interesting to point out um, there there were some aid societies that would would offer some uh, succor and assistance, but that was uh, rare and, and uh, all too often not enough. The federal government, of course, reneged on many of their pension programs for disabled uh, sailors and soldiers during this time period, as they would again in World War One, World War Two, the Korean War, Vietnam, and more recently in the. Uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's of course nothing. The United States has um, uh, the, the the purchase on other nations did the same. England, Germany, and others as well. But what you see here is something really interesting too, because um, these these uh, persons coming back with uh, uh, disabilities were sometimes um, um, 
found that they'd lost their employment. They couldn't work as in their farms. They couldn't be hired. So New York City, for example, did something that um, my research showed is they they waived um, fees for vending on streets and they allowed uh, disabled Civil War soldiers returning to um, start vending products. So today, you know, if you visit the, the Big Apple, you'll you'll find that there are hot dog and pretzel carts everywhere. And at one time, those were all owned by veterans uh, and disabled veterans. And here's something interesting you might find, find telling about the uh, former um, presidential candidate who shall not be named who became a president. Uh, um, he was able to successfully overturn a um, hundred years of tradition uh, of allowing disabled veterans to vend on the streets of New York City, arguing that he didn't want any of these unsightly uh, men in front of his hotels, right? So um, just when you think that um, uh, these long uh, attitudes uh, um, uh, don't reach into contemporary society, you might find that they do. And you're know, moving very rapidly here, but World War I is also going to um, um, continue this kind of process. And again, the uh, looking at veterans who receive poor treatment with their disabilities, um, World War I is going to take the cake in terms of that. Um, conserved estimates, you know, would, would put, um, you know, uh, tens of millions of, of service men and women being uh, permanently wounded and the particular kinds of disabilities in this war are going to be even more exacerbated than in the technologies of the Civil War and the Boer War and the Crimean War with the uh, uh, particular uh, development of the machine gun and rapid fire and um, long range artillery and uh, poisonous gases and, and so forth that will uh, leave uh, tens of millions of young men disabled for life the particular kinds of injuries that are uh, are, are interesting this one I, I found in my research was that uh, because we were using trench warfare um, head injuries were often um, encountered and uh, oftentimes they they were um, disfigurements of people's faces and so plastic surgery actually develops um, during this time period to try to uh, develop and solve these facial disfigurements. And there was uh, a center hospital in a small town in England that specialized in this kind of surgical procedure for uh, disfigured veterans who had maybe lost their jaw or had part of their head removed or what have you. Um, and the citizens complained um, that it was a uh, uh, shocking for them to walk through town to see these uh, disfigured men. So uh, the city um, uh, uh, decided in its infinite wisdom to set aside certain benches and they're going to color these benches uh, red. And so these were known as red benches. I think it was red if I remember correctly. And so those were only places where these disfigured persons could sit. Right. And so you could avoid them if you were going to be um, bothered by the sight of anyone's disability. Right. Um, uh, in the United States, we're going to see similar kinds of practices with the development of the so-called ugly laws, which were a series of laws uh, instituted in the United States from the 1920s to the 1970s, where every major municipality will um, um, pass laws that uh, one could literally be arrested for being ugly, and overwhelmingly that meant persons with disabilities who were seen as offensive. I remember uh, back in the 80s, uh, uh, um, someone wrote into Ann Landers saying that, uh, or maybe it was Dear Abby, and she was complaining that um, people with disabilities went out to dinner um, and, you know, couldn't they stay at home because they bothered this person. And of course, much to her credit, um, uh, um, Ann or Abby, I forget which one it was, uh, um, you know, upbraided the person for such uh, behavior. But the slew of letters that came in 
uh, offered ways to solve the problem. Like, well, you could just put potted plants around disabled people to hide them from other eaters. And again, this notion that disability is this thing. And it's all going to come to head in the uh, 1930s um, in um, the rise of the Reich. Um, and uh, this kind of circles back to this original uh, prompt that I started with about being accosted on 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 on, on Church Street uh, with the gentleman referencing the Chief War program it wasn't exclusively a Nazi thing. Uh, indeed, uh, the antecedents run far wide and deep, as I've shown. Um, so, for example, D.H. Uh, uh, Lawrence once said that he wished all sick and lame and halted people would be brought into a uh, uh, a, a, a building and set a fire. Um, and a number of physicians are going to write books uh, about useless eaters and life's not worth living uh, that become the basis for the rise of uh, the T4 program that systematically tried to exterminate persons with disabilities. And they started, of course, with children and would move on uh, to uh, persons in mental health institutions and then disabled veterans. Hitler had made a promise to disabled veterans that they were the first um, persons of the nation, but he would renege on that promise and go after them as well. And knowing that they were dealing with something rather controversial, um, they engaged in a mass propaganda um, project that demonized persons with disabilities. And you would see a lot of these kinds of um, graphics that I'm illustrating behind me showing, you know, that the good uh, Aryan worker is burdened by having to um, support these uh, uh, deformed and disabled and um, uh, um, challenged individuals, right? Uh, and you see this kind of thing would be blanketed all around. They're going to skillfully use uh, film to do this as well, um, as we'll see. Um, uh, and just to show you that they weren't alone, there's this famous um, uh, Nazi era propaganda film about uh, the process of eugenics and uh, so forth, you know, that says, we don't stand alone. Look at all these other nations that are doing this, right? And uh, quite sadly, the United States stars and stripes are right up there. Um, and uh, and that's going to culminate in the scapegoating of the Liebenswertes Lieben, the life not unworthy of life. And it's going to start with a letter that was sent to uh, Hitler. Um, uh, and I want to read that uh, from my book. So I think it, it really hits home. And uh, uh, you'll see that uh, the, the, the T4 program is... Uh, <clears throat> is going to be sort of the culmination of many of these uh, uh, literary and historic and mythological practices of discrimination that we've seen uh, tonight and that I detail in my book. And uh, just so that you know that any one of these references I've been making tonight, there's there's many more um, in, in here. Um, I'm going to start with the French sociologist Jean Baudrillard's uh, uh, famous uh, quote about uh, forgetting and memory. Forgetting the extermination is part of the extermination itself. A letter from a rural German community citizen reached Adolf Hitler dated July 1939. The Fuhrer received many such letters, but this one was no ordinary letter. In this letter, Richard and Lena Kretzmer asked for permission to kill their five-month-old son, Gerhard. You see, he had been born with only one leg and some slight vision loss, and they hated him. They called them the monster. The Kretschmars were convinced that his very existence was contrary to the erring ideals of genetic purity and perfection being advanced by the Reich, and in which they firmly believed. Hitler welcomed the letter and granted the permission in an unprecedented executive act, and the young child was murdered by Hitler's very own personal doctor, Karl Braun, five days later. Gerhardt would be buried in the local Lutheran churchyard, and the church records would say he died of a weakness of the heart. The only apparent weakness of heart that I can see in this story is German culture itself and the Nazis. And that begins an Anschluss of extermination. Soon Brandt will 
be tasked with developing a systematic program that will be understood as the T4 program that will culminate in the death of, well, an untold number of children at first. I mean, um, conservative estimates put it anywhere between 300 and 400,000 children. Uh, we don't know because the, the Nazis falsified all the records. Um, but the picture of the young boy with Down syndrome behind me would be one of the children. What 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 was a uh, a, a disability that um, put you on um, one of these lists that um, included everything from uh, learning disabilities to lists to epilepsy to um, any number of physical conditions and uh, and and what happened was every. Uh, every municipality and school district and doctor's office throughout Germany and then later Nazi controlled um, regions uh, would be required to list um, children with disabilities. And this material would be sent to a central um, site that was the site of the uh, known as the KDF, which also was the health and recreation division of the Reich. And there, uh, and T4 is the name of the uh, street that it's on. And uh, they would collate these lists and then send out um, vans to pick up these children. These children, parents would be told that there's a cure uh, or an institution that's going to take care of their child for them, right? And uh, these children would be then uh, transported to a number of hospitals throughout Germany where they would be killed. At first, they were just going to starve them to death. And then uh, they found that that was taking too long. So they developed um, a technique of gassing the children. In fact, Zyklon B that would be later put to such horrific uh, use in the killing camps of Auschwitz and others will have, will be developed in this program. Indeed, many of the uh, uh, officials who will uh, orchestrate and lead uh, the T4 program would later become the commandants of those camps. I guess they felt that if uh, you could kill a dis child with a disability, you could kill um, an adult um, easily. And, uh, you know, and this, this program would, as I said, uh, and uh, as my research showed, you know, uh, would, would go through the population of, of Germany and uh, Austria and Czechoslovakia and France, wherever, Poland, wherever the Nazis conquered, they would set up these centers. Uh, and uh, they'd falsify the, the medical records. So you would probably want to know, where did your son go, um, uh, your daughter go? And you would uh, probably make a request and you'd get a, a letter back from the Reich saying that unfortunately um, there was a, 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 a a development in the surgery or the child died from some other condition um, and uh, the Reich uh, would then later uh, offer the remains in terms of um, ashes um, uh, and these were just going to be um, um, a bunches of ashes that they would send back but uh, the medical records would be falsified so historically it's been very difficult to actually uh, document exactly how many uh, children and later persons with disabilities would be exterminated during this program. And here's the kicker. Unlike the uh, Nazi doctors who would face um, the Nuremberg Tribunal for Crimes Against Humanity, no doctor, no nurse, no person, right, who was involved with the T4 program would ever face justice. Many of these people would filter back into society and move to America, and, and they would uh, they would become part and parcel of the of the 1940s and 50s medical community. Right. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that when asked um, about the justice of what they were doing, they would often, like their uh, fellow Nazis at Nuremberg said, you can't blame us. You were doing that already, right? And indeed, uh, we were, that the United States, um, uh, through its eugenic programs, had since the late 19th, early uh, 20th century, established uh, programs that sought to get rid of the feeble-minded, the disabled, the idiot, um, all these wonderful classical terms, um, uh, institutionalized them forcibly, and if they couldn't be institutionalized, 
Um, they could be either voluntarily or involuntarily sterilized. So you would uh, clean up the so-called germplasm. And as many of you might know, if you uh, live in Vermont, Vermont was uh, notorious and the University of Vermont in particular for being um, one of the centers for eugenics and the eugenic survey uh, that um, was going to begin in the 1920s and 30s and, and uh, not really end until the 19, 1960s. Um, and uh, over half of the states in the United States, 37 to be exact, would pass some form of eugenics bill that was targeted at persons with disabilities. Um, others would be included, so racial minorities, members of BIPOC communities, in particular indigenous communities, um, uh, would all um, be uh, targeted by these programs. And uh, in Vermont, um, uh, we know that's about minimally, and again, conservatively, uh, the data is still um, to be researched uh, effectively. Um, some 250 so sterilizations occurred and many more um, institutionalizations would occur during this time period. Um, and, uh, you know, they were often de described as uh, mentally deficient or feeble minded. Um, uh, and often their only crime was that they um, were poor and they didn't fit into the, uh, you know, the dominant ethos of the ruling class that was making the rules and, and doing the diagnoses and uh, uh, so forth. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Nazis, uh, like the Americans, would have to engage in, a, in quite a few um, uh, creative uh, forms of propaganda to create this. And so in the United States, often state and town and agricultural fairs would become the vehicle by which they convince people uh, about the necessity to make a better America uh in these uh fitter family programs and contests so uh people would be offered prizes if uh they had a genealogy if they could show that there's no disability uh in their family and then they'd um uh, uh, be uh entered into a contest where they might win a win a prize and um the skillful use of, of media becomes um, uh, the next tool to sort of broadcast these sort of visions. Um, um, if you look at modernist literature beginning in the 1920s um, with Ernest Hemingway, his major story, The Sun Also Rises, has uh, disabled the war veteran in it who uh, is, is, is dissatisfied and everything, can't find anything, can't find love or anything. Sort of sounds like Frankenstein and these other characters have been talking to it. And if we bookend that um, with the, uh, you know, the other character, uh, on one hand, you have Jake Barnes from Hemingway, on the other, you have Jake Sully from um, uh, uh, Avatar. You have a disabled veteran who chooses that uh, his life's not worth living as a, as a disabled individual, so he'd rather live as a, as a fictional avatar in 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 this world right um and that um is 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 how the legacy of the uh um history of disability manifests today it's it's often in a subtle but um virulently hate-filled agenda in hollywood um where uh, disabled activists talk about disability snuff films and one was the uh, romance novel, Me Before You, which became a big blockbuster hit, I think, in around 2016 or so. And if you're unfamiliar with the movie, uh, it has a quadriplegic millionaire who uh, hires an assistant and they fall in love. And he doesn't want to live. His life is not worth living. Um, uh, she wants him to live. He uh, strikes a bargain with her and lets him go off and euthanize himself um, and gives him all her money, gives him her money. No, excuse me, gives her him his money so that uh, she can live her dreams. And that was just taken in almost um, uh, verse by verse from a film um, developed in the 1930s called Ishkliga An, um, which has this same plot line. Um, and it's interesting to note that this is a long line of Hollywood films um, that uh, feature the denigration and destruction of persons with disabilities that, you know, people just um, uh, absorb and don't even think about it. So Million Dollar Baby, 
um, so many of them um, uh, fit into this motif, right? So, um, you know, and, and my, my book ends with um, uh, a killing in Japan where um, a gentleman had been sending letters <clears throat> to the prefecture in Japan and uh, saying that um, he finds that people with disabilities are disgusting and shouldn't live. Uh, and this 26 year old man fantasized about killing them and said he could kill up to, uh, you know, 470 persons with disability a day. And he was able to find employment in, in homes with people with disabilities. And um, the authorities never took him seriously. Um, he would go on to act on his plan on Tuesday, July 26. Um, in 2016, he would enter a, um, a facility for persons and children with disabilities called Sukai Lily Garden, where he would uh, murder 19 persons with disabilities and uh, seriously injure 25 others. And claiming as he, uh, after he did it, he walked carefully and quietly down to the police station, turned him in, saying it is better that disabled people disappear. And that, um, you know, and then so I closed my, my book with that because I think what you see is that from the begins, beginning of culture, written culture, textual society with um, uh, Abrahamic stories and the Greeks and the Romans, um, you have this one-sided set of stories that does that sees disability not as mere difference, but as negatively different and, and then scapegoats. And, and then it becomes so powerful that um, we, uh, we, we feel we have to either cure it or remove it, uh, get rid of it, eradicate it. And our institutions of care um, are often um, um, have this sort of deeper uh, latent uh, goal of, of doing that. And uh, it's everywhere in our society when one starts looking for it. Now, of course, there are, um, you know, and my book does end in the middle of the 20th century. There have been um, wonderful de developments. I don't want to leave you all with uh, uh, a completely negative uh, uh, view here because uh, with the disability rights movement and the civil rights movement and, uh, you know, many allies and persons with disabilities like the late Judy Human, uh, the mother of dis disability rights movement, uh, and so many others, they have made strides and uh, have started to push back on some of these worse forms, but it's it's still with us today and, and uh, um, as evidenced by um, some of the more recent uh, things that I do include in my book. So um, so that's a, 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 a sketch of uh, my um, uh, scholarship and book, and I invite you to take a look at it. And uh, um, if uh, uh, Jacob has some um, questions, I'd be you know, more than willing to uh, uh, ask if answer a few. If there's anybody still there, if I haven't uh, entirely. No worries. No, thank you for this. This was you're, incredible you're welcome. and a whole wealth of information to kind of explore and unravel. And please, um, to the people still with us, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, one question I had for you is kind of where do you see the next steps in your research around this theme? Yeah. So, you know, as, as I said, the, the, the original manuscript was over 700 pages and I went really up to, you know, contemporary television. I was looking uh, in culture, excuse me, and I was looking at some reality television, you know, that has been developed in the last five or six years and this sort of strange fascination with, um, you know, uh, persons with uh, uh, disabilities, you know, like the, uh, um, uh, uh, Little big people, little big world with the uh, Roloff family, uh, my, you know, my 600 pound wife, you know, and you know, th these sorts of things that became sort of flashpoints in our culture very recently. And then, of course, the, uh, um, you know, many of the movements since the 1950s and 60s, like the Paralympic movement, uh, disability rights movement, um, you know, the uh, a variety of organizations. Uh, um, have have really started to push back on these forms of discrimination and have had uh, a lot of success. And so uh, I was looking at that in the latter part of my book that I would like to continue. And uh, I'm also uh, currently writing a book on the history of adaptive sports and um, where that came from and uh, uh, what that means and how it goes forward too. So 
Um, so there's a lot of, lot of material in, you know, it's one of those things where uh, when I was thinking about uh, putting together this book, I wanted a single volume history that was still readable, that was still small enough that someone could get through in one semester because there really wasn't. There's one really good one in French uh, written in the 1980s, but no recent ones. But the amount of scholarship coming out of disability studies program, uh, particularly in Canada and England, um, is just amazing. And, you know, virtually every week I, I, I find another um, book length treatment of, uh, of something, you know, like, you know, uh, disability depiction in 13th century, um, you know, court life or something like that, right? That uh, just reveals um, that there's so much more information out there. It always reminds me that you never know what you might turn up if you go to the archives or turn that next page of the book, right? So thank yeah. you for inspiring us to keep looking yeah, at Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it look, looks like we have one other question that came in is, what else do you, is known about the, the bioarchaeology of care that you could No, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, Judy, thanks for that question, because uh, a number of uh, archaeologists and anthropologists have started to pioneer this field. And what they've really been doing is uh, looking at areas where um, much of what we've looked at before, um, scientists were looking at with ableist assumptions and they didn't see uh, or they would, you know, they, they, they'd see a particular deformity or something and say, well, this this is clearly what you know, did the person in when, when you, if you go back um, with this different approach uh, with an open mind, you might, the bones might tell you something else. And they might say, wait, 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 that, that injury had healed and that person lived for another 20, 30, 40 years. And so uh, they're, they're starting to extrapolate on that. Of course, here's where it gets really difficult in anything like archaeology is that there's very little you can say with any confidence um, beyond just the um, the material stuff that you have, right? Um, you know, clearly, you know, in those instances of the Nazca child and the, the man back child uh, and others um, that we've seen, uh, you know, somebody had to take care of them, right? They they would have had to been fed and, and grow, um, you know, clothed and, and, and provide hygiene. So that means that, you know, it wasn't this world that we grew up with thinking where, you know, disability is going to be shunned and, you know, ostracized that, that prior to modernity and indeed this sort of the Greco-Roman period, there seems to be this, this, this ability to care for people. Right? And, and it still is found in many indigenous cultures and their practices. And in fact, there's some, um, you know, uh, interesting work looking at um, Norse culture and how uh, particularly a, a, a leader by the name of um, Ivar the Boneless, um, you know, was disabled and his, his uh, fellow Vikings would carry him in on a, on, 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 into battle so he could fight. Right? And he lived to a long life this way, right? So, so it's clearly showing that we have to reappraise the past with open eyes and looking at it in this way. And so there's a lot in uh, bioarchaeology and I'm not an archaeologist, so I've just been, um, you know, uh, looking at the, their research, but um, um, email me and I can send you some of the, uh, some of the scholars in that field. And I guess Great. this last one to, to finish us up and I think is a, a good point. Um, is Bridget mentions that you touch a lot on kind of non-Western cultures, but wondering if you had a chance to kind of delve into that more, seeing that so much of kind of our, our ableism influence came from Western society post enlightenment period. Yeah, so in, in, in my text, and I apologize for not covering those in, in tonight's talk, but in my, in my book, I, I, I do um, uh, look at um, uh, the influences of, uh, of um, Hinduism and Taoism and Confucianism and Buddhism in particular. I may mean, have a whole chapter on Buddhism that says compassion for all except for the disabled, because what you do find is, um, uh, particularly in Buddhist cultures, a lot of 
of of discrimination against persons with disabilities uh, and it has to do with this notion of of fate or kismet or karma right that is implicit in those designs and those religious traditions where you know you 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 live the life you you merit right you deserve so if you're born with disability or something bad happens to you it's your fault right so it's hard to feel compassionate towards someone who did something in an earlier incarnation you know that deserved such treatment and so that that kind of framework becomes the source of a lot of disdain and discrimination that we see. Now, of course, there are always going to be exceptions, right? And, you know, the better angels of every tradition, you know, seek, uh, you know, more just ways of dealing with people. So you're, you're going to find exceptions to that. But as a rule, uh, generally speaking, you, you find a lot of discrimination implicit in those. You, you find them less so in indigenous cultures. Um, so, for example, in, in many Native American and Canadian languages, they don't have a word that could be translated to disabled, right? Um, because they have they don't have the same kind of binary logic that was developed in the uh, sort of in the Greco-Roman period, you know, of you know, of in, out, up, down, good, bad, right? They they're gonna see things in 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 a in a in a more um 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 uh, less of a geometrical and mathematical um set of metaphors um with language and uh, more more organic, if you will. Right. Uh, because if you look, I mean, if, if you look at the non-human world, disability is pretty prevalent, too. Right. Uh, animals live with disability. Right. They, they you know, and, uh, um, you know, it's you know, it's not all what television projects, you know, projects it to be, which is that sort of like red in tooth and claw lion always goes after the weak gazelle kind of thing. That's not that's that's Hollywood. Right. That's that's, you know, again, sort of showing you. Um, the dominant beliefs of a dominant um, um, class in our society, right? Uh, animals, you know, um, live by symbiosis and cooperation and mutual aid and, you know, as, as, as much. So you, you do see that even in the animal kingdom as well. Um, so, you, and, and you do see, uh, as you mentioned, you know, um, uh, like in recent television uh, programs or theater or movies, uh, you know, more opportunities for um, breaking down many of these barriers, right? And, uh, you know, my book kind of leaves you hanging in the, you know, the, you know, in, you know, with a sort of a sour note, a bad note. And, and but there are, uh, you know, some great strides being made in terms of inclusion and, and, and talking about, um, these things and pushing back against discrimination in any of its forms. Um, I mean, we still see, for example, if you if you find a disabled character in television or or film, it's almost always going to be portrayed by an able-bodied actor when there are plenty of talented and capable of disabled actors out there. So, you know, while you might have a um, you know, a, a, a token representation of someone, the hard work still needs to be done, right? Uh, the actual representation or, you know, uh, letting persons with disabilities uh, carve their own place in the world um, is, still a, is still challenging. 